And so, as I was thinking about that uh, and what I was going to minister on, the Lord had put on my heart the blessing of the Jews, which there's a song that we sing. I just downloaded it into my phone. And it's out of uh, Numbers chapter 6, if you could put that up for us, uh, Haley. Um, I'm using the King James Version of the Bible. Numbers chapter 6, verses uh, 24 through 26. And it, it speaks about the goodness of God and God's favor on the lives of his people. Amen. It says, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. I'm sure that if I was going to ask you if you can remember times in your life where maybe the countenance of God wasn't upon you. Maybe you would say, yeah, there were times in my life that the face of God was not shining upon me. Where, where the blessings of God were not overtaking me. But yet at the same time, I would hope and pray that you've come to a place where as you've given your heart to the Lord, that you've seen God begin to move and to operate in your life. Sometimes it doesn't always look like it in the physical realm. You know, like sometimes we still have struggles in our finances. Sometimes we still have struggles in various relationships with our families and various things like that. But I would hope and pray, I know this, that if you've truly given your heart to the Lord, if you've truly yielded your will to his will and you've allowed him to come in, and if you will continue to surrender, again, that's a big part of the equation, is whether or not we're willing to surrender. But when we do that, the Holy Spirit will begin to move and he will begin to bring healing to our hearts and in the midst of our lives. And we will know, we will begin to feel the blessing of God in our lives. And you know, that was one of the first things he said, may the Lord bless thee. And, and, I, and I put the definition of bless, it means that in that word, the hand of favor, the benefit of God on the life. Amen. What a beautiful thing to have the, the creator of heaven and earth and all that in them is to have his hand of favor and to be experiencing the benefit of God over our lives. You know, one of the passages of scripture, we don't have to turn to it, that came to my heart when I was thinking about the blessing of God overtaking people. I thought of the story whenever David brought the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem, right? You remember the story that they had to sacrifice an animal every six cases, which is interesting to me because man was created on the sixth day. Every six steps, they had, to, they had to sacrifice an animal. I remember Ross, I keep giving him credit, even though he preached it about 15 years ago. Ross Kippendo preached a message and he said, can you look backwards and see the trail of blood that left the place where the ark previously was and brought it all the way back to Jerusalem because it required sacrifice, really, for the presence of the Lord to be able to show up in the midst of our services. You need to understand, it doesn't matter how high you can jump and it doesn't matter how good you can sing. Without the blood of Jesus, then you and I cannot experience the presence of God. And whenever the Holy Spirit shows up in the house, he wants you and I to give glory to the eternal lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. And he's the one that sets you free. And he's the one that wants to make your heart feel free to worship and to exalt the name of Jesus. Praise God. But look, and so, so Jay, and you know the story, David, because see, that's what I've heard worship pastors preach that before. You know, David, David brought back the presence of the Lord in his worship. And don't get me wrong, but David, no, David was excited because the presence of the Lord was coming back. And David was excited and he, and the Lord revealed to him how to bring the presence of the Lord back. Because with man, there was a man that, that tried to stand in the ark on the way back the first time and he was struck dead. Man cannot create the presence of God in and of his own strength. God has a plan, amen. And the plan was to send his only begotten son. But look, there's a story hidden in the pages, a man named Obed-Edom. His name was Obed-Edom. You can read about it in 2 Samuel. But the, the, the Obed-Edom was a Gittite. And for three months, the ark rested in his house. 
After, after the, the, he tried, that man tried to stabilize the ark and he was struck dead, they had to just drop the ark off in somebody's front yard. And it happened to be in the front yard of Obed-Edom. And he took care of the ark of the covenant. Now listen, if you've been coming to our church for a while, you know this. But most people, if you don't know yet, I'm going to let you know tonight. That the ark of the covenant is directly related to the presence of God. All right, let me, let me just break it down for you just real quick, real time, real quick. Exodus 25, 8, the Lord tells Moses, build me a sanctuary. Build me a tent so that my presence might dwell with my people. If you continue to read through there, what you begin to see is this. He says, and I want a curtain. And beyond that curtain, there's going to be a box. Hallelujah. It's called the ark. And within that box, you're going to put my law, the law of the testimony. And on top of that box, you're going to put a mercy seat. And you're going to build two cherubim, two angels that are going to face one another and look down at the mercy seat. And there, but beyond the veil, between the cherubim, upon the mercy seat, that is where I will meet with you. And so in the Old Testament, the ark of the covenant, the mercy seat, represents the presence of of God. And when that man tried to stabilize that cart and he was struck dead and that Ark of the Covenant was left in Obed-Edom's house, the Bible says that one of the servants of David told him, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertains unto him because of the Ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. He said, no, the ark of God, but the presence of God belongs in the city of peace. Hallelujah. That's what the name Jerusalem means. And so Jerusalem, it means the city of peace, the place of peace where the presence of the Lord is. There is peace. You want peace in your house, my friend. Listen, I don't know about you tonight, but I can tell you I rebel against God. I have rebelled against God in my heart before as a believer, as a man of God that loved the Lord. I, have re I don't want to rebel against the presence of God. Oh Lord, I want the Holy Spirit to want to inhabit me. I want the Holy Spirit to feel comfortable in my presence. I want to create an environment where the Holy Spirit wants to be around me. I don't know about you, but I'm done rebelling by the grace of God. Lord, give me a heart that yields to you. Holy Spirit, make my heart soft towards you. That I'd surrender to you. That my ear would be sensitive to your voice. Oh, sweet Spirit of God, that I would hear you and yield that I would hearken. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. David said, no, we need the presence of the Lord up in this city. Right here in the house of God where it belongs. Amen. If somebody's going to be blessed, let the people of God be blessed. Amen. You know, there's another scripture that came to my mind about the blessings of God. Uh, it, it comes out of, y'all heard, y'all ever heard of the prayer of j Y'all remember that was a little fad that came through a while back? Some of y'all might be too young to remember that. But, but in First Chronicles, it's, it's one of those passages of Scripture. You'd miss it because this one begat that one, and that one begat that one, and that, and you get tired of reading all the begats, and this begat that. And but, when, but if you're not careful, and you're reading in First Chronicles chapter four, you'll miss it. You can put it up there, Haley, on First Chronicles four verses nine and ten. So it just goes on. This one was begat that one, and then all of a sudden it says, and Jabez was more honorable. Then his brethren and his mother called his name Jabez saying, because I bear him with sorrow. Now, that's what the word, the name Jabez means, sorrow. Could you imagine that? Mama called, named you sorrow. You know, I, I felt led by the Holy Spirit when I was in the jail in Oregon City today. I didn't have this plan, but the Holy Spirit put it on my heart that likelihood that many of those men that were behind those bars that their family members had spoken things over their lives. It's possible that people have spoken things in the past over your life. Yeah. I know that people spoke negative things yeah. over my life. The enemy wants to use human vessels to speak negative things over your life. He'll still use people that you work with to try, especially people in the oil field. I know these things because I was in the oil field. I spent a lot enough time in the oil field to know how some of these jokers act. 
Okay, and they'll try to beat you down. They'll try to make you feel low. And they'll try to come at you with all of this stuff. And it's not going to do any good to try to beat them at their own game. You know, the best thing that, that you can do, let me tell you, if you're working in the oil field, the best thing you can do is let yourself get fooled up with the Holy Ghost. And you know what you do? You come back with the boldness of a lion, my friend. And the Holy Spirit will fill your mouth to let to give them a Holy Ghost what for. And it'll shut them down real quick. And they might laugh at you. They might make fun of you behind your back, but praise God, I can tell you right now. Uh, look, I'm about to tell you a testimony. There was a, there was a man uh, that, that, that the old church we used to go to. He's an elder of the church over there. His name was Brother, uh, Brother Tommy Corlin. And, and Brother Tommy t told a story one time about how he used to, a man that he worked with, that we used to cuss him lower than the dog. Every time he'd go into his presence, he said, man, I hated to have to even go into that man's office, but sometimes I had to go in there because he would just cuss and he would talk so bad about me. And, and he said, and then, and then he ended up retiring. And he didn't see him for many, many years. And then he read in the obituary that the man had died. And he received a phone call from the man's wife. And the man's wife said, Tommy, I don't think you ever had an opportunity to know this. I don't know why he never really called you and told you. But I want you to know that he gave his heart to the Lord. Oh. And that he talked about you all the time. About how you had influenced his life. And I felt like you needed to know that. I just want to encourage you. Because I don't know what you're facing, right? And I'm like, amen. He deserves the glory. Listen, we never know the seeds that we're planting and the effect that they can have. We need to hold on to the Lord. Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. His mama called him sorrow. But you know what, the, but you know what Jabez said in verse 9, towards the end of verse, uh, I'm sorry, verse 10? He said this. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. <laughs> Amen. Mama might have called me sorrow. The people at work might call me sorry. The people though, that I grew up with in school might have clowned me. This one might have said that. That one might have done that. But oh, that you would bless me indeed. I dare somebody to be able to have the, enough hope on the inside of them to trust that the God of glory is able and more than able to bless their life and to call out upon him and to watch and see what he will do in their life. Oh, that you would bless me indeed, that you would enlarge my coast, that your hand would be with me. Can, can I tell you something? You don't have to try. Oh, Lord, how do you even say this in proper context? You don't have to do things in a worldly way to try to gain promotion. What, what I'm trying to say is, is that some, you ever notice how sometimes people are fake? It, fake it, towards the boss? And they ain't really like working as hard as what they act like they are. You know, they got a name for it, but I feel weird saying it from behind the pulpit. You know, but, 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 they, but, they, but they go out of their way to make it look like they're trying to do everything. But in reality, it's, it's, a, it's a show. You, you understand what I'm getting at? Yeah. Okay, you don't have to do that kind of right. Can, can I tell you that? You don't have to act that way. But but if you will let the Holy Spirit have his way on the inside of your heart, he, the Holy Spirit will start to contend with you. Because see, the scriptures talk about your workplace. The scriptures talk about your work ethic. And the scriptures say that you have a master in heaven. Amen. Amen. And that you work for him. And if you will work as unto the Lord, let me tell you. The people on earth are going to be real happy with your productivity. I can promise you that. If you work to please him, if you work with a spirit of excellence to please him, hallelujah, it's going to be easy to please the people on earth. I believe that. And then maybe not. But the scripture's got a word for the boss too. That, that he, has a, uh, he has a God in heaven too, especially if he's a believer, and that he'll have to answer to God for the way that he treats his workers. Amen. So I just want to encourage you with that because see, Jabez said that you would bless me indeed, that you would enlarge my coast, that your hand would be with me. And I wanted to set, tell you this: is that promotion doesn't you, promotion doesn't come from from where, where you think it comes from. Amen. As a matter of fact, the other day I was sharing with one of my my doctors that I've been working with. I mean, this guy really had was instrumental. God used him as a tool in my life. To really bless me. Back at, you know, and I still work there two days a week, but there were some times, some years where financially, like I was really 
be blessed by this company. Amen. And, and he made God used him as a tool to make it all happen. And I told him that. I said, you know, God really used you in my life. And I want I want you to know that I'm very grateful for your willingness to, you know, for, for what you did for me through the years. But can I tell you that that it wasn't just him by himself that came up with those plans. That was God's plan for, for my life. Amen. And God's the one that gives promotion. God's the one that opens up doors and closes doors. And and, and, and man may say, come tell you that you're so, that you're sorrow. And man may say that you're sorry, but Jabez called upon the one that can change all of that. Amen. And so I don't know what the enemy's trying to put on you. I don't know. Maybe you're watching on video and the enemy's trying to put something on you. But I'm here to tell you right now, you're not sorrow. You don't have to be full of sorrow. You can be full of the joy of the Lord. Amen. He said, oh, that you would bless me indeed. Amen. You know, someone has to believe that God even exists to call upon him out of nowhere and to say, oh, that you would bless me indeed. I receive to receive the report. I refuse to receive the report of what my mama said. Oh, that you would bless me indeed, oh, Lord God, that you would pour your anointing and your blessing upon my life. You got to believe that God's real in order to call on him like that. And then if you believe God's real, why would we not call on him like that? Because the enemy comes in. Come on now, this isn't even in my notes. But, the, but, but listen, the enemy comes in and he tries to cause confusion. He comes and he tries to weight us down. We open up these little doors thinking that we can just take a little peek, thinking that it's going to be okay, that we play around with this little thing, we play around with that little thing, and then the next thing you know, the enemy starts heaping burdens and weights and sins upon us, and we're not even, we're, 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 he starts to hinder us. When in reality, we should be taking authority in the spiritual realm and paralyzing them demon spirits. What ends up happening is, is that the weight of the enemy starts trying to paralyze us. To where we can't even use our vocal cords to bless God anymore. To, to, come on, we lose our strength, our spiritual strength. No, we, don't, we want to learn how to not give in. Amen. So the first thing he said was bless thee, the Lord bless thee. Amen. The second thing he said was the Lord keep thee. And, and the definition for the Lord keep thee, that word keep thee, is to guard or hedge about with thorns. Yes. Now, nowadays, if, you know, sometimes you go to these maximum security prisons. Some of us, you know, have been to prisons to minister. Some people have actually been in prisons, right? But, you know, they got these, these barbed wires. And then sometimes what they'll do, that razor wire. And it's, and it's rolled up. And sometimes, not only do they have it up at the top, but they'll put it like a few feet outside the fence. So like, okay, you think you're going to be mad enough? Now you got to jump off in a pool of that stuff, right? <laughs> and, and so, but before they had razor blade, razor wire, this was an old ancient military tactic where they would take these huge amounts of thorns and, and these militaries would create a perimeter of a hedge of thorns. That's what it literally is in the Hebrew. Keep thee. It's a hedge of thorns that is placed around. And the, and, the, and the purpose of this was to try to prevent those war horses from, from rushing in and, and to invade their space and to make a breach in their perimeter. Okay? And, and so the, the, the Lord is here to keep you and I. Amen? He built a hedge of protection in the spiritual realm where the enemy can't come against us. Amen? Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare, Lord, right now, hallelujah, that you would build a hedge of protection, the blood of Jesus, over these people, over their families, over their children, oh, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. The Lord says, when you pray, pray this way. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. From evil. I'll be talking about that coming up pretty soon when I get back from Mexico. But look, Lord, build a hedge of protection around us. Yes, Lead us not into temptation. Yes. Lord, protect us from the evil one. Oh, protect us from his onslaught in the name of Jesus. You know, Jude only has one chapter. In verse 24 of Jude, it's, I, I like this because it's the word keep. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Okay, let me, let me read that to you again. To him 
that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. What do you, what do you think that means? I mean, do you think he really meant that, that he is able to keep you from falling? Or you think that's just something that Jesus' half-brother just decided to scribble up in there that that wasn't really... No, 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 no. The scripture says that he, the Lord, is able to keep you from falling. Amen. And to present you fall, faultless before the presence of the Lord. Amen. Now, now that's the Lord's work. Amen. But, but what I want you to understand, see, because see, sometimes people even have a wrong understanding of Romans chapter 7. They'll say, whenever Paul says, the thing that I don't want to do, that is what I do. And the thing that I want to do, that is not what I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And, and, they, and, they, and then what they'll say is, see, it's the sin in me. It's the sin in me that's got the best of me. And, and, and what they become is they become resolved in their mind that we're just, we're not Jesus. And so we're going to fall because we got sin in us. But that's not what that chapter is saying. That chapter is saying, yes, you have a sinful nature that you receive from your father, Adam. But Jesus broke the power of the sinful nature in your life. Amen. And if you will learn that and begin to believe that and keep your faith squarely focused on the finished work of Christ, then the Holy Spirit releases grace and to him that is able to keep you from falling. It's only him and him alone. It's only his grace and his power and his strength as we yield to his truth that can keep us from falling and to present us blameless before the Lord. Amen. 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 Now there's things in our life that sometimes we don't even know that they're sin until the Lord reveals it yes. to us. But I'm talking about to him that knows to do right, doesn't do it, to him it is sin. To those things revealed in the scripture, to that sin that so easily besets us, to that weight that tries to ensnare us and pull us off the race. I'm talking about those things. We, we don't have to fall prey to that. In the name of Jesus. I'm here to tell you the word of God says you're free in Christ Jesus. The word of God says that Jesus has already accomplished it. That it's a done deal. Amen. And that you and I can learn to surrender to that. I believe that. And look, as you and I start turning, submitting to the will of God, resisting the devil, he begins to flee. And the further we walk away from the sin, the further we get away from the sin, the less them demons really want to hang out with you. I'm going to be honest with you. They're not going to quit easy. Oh, no, I believe in demons. And if you don't believe in demons, you came to the wrong church. The Word of God says we're not in a wrestling match with flesh and blood. Okay? And those demons don't want to let go. As a matter of fact, they like playing around. Come on. Demons like to live in the nasty environment and they definitely want to bring down God's people. But guess what? Whenever you start turning towards holiness, when you start putting worship inside of your heart, when you start putting prayer and spending intimate time with the Lord, them demons might get mad. They might try to rattle in your cage a little bit, but they don't have a welcome mat in your heart. Amen. Not whenever Jesus' blood has been applied to the doorpost of your heart. They have no right there. Amen. And, and the less you hang out with them, they, they're going to they're gonna try to go find somebody else to play with. They're going to get tired of trying to play with you to some extent. Come on. No, they'll come back. The devil that never quit. Let me, let me be clear. I know some of y'all got to tell the wheels turning. I know what the devil said. Whenever he was trying to tempt Jesus, he said he laughed and he waited for another season, for a better opportunity. Okay, because he ain't never going to quit. And sooner or later, if he can't get you, keep getting you with the same old stuff, he's going to switch the bait. And you got to be ready because the Bible says it. He says he's wily. Yes. Yes. He's full of trickery, yes. schemes, methodia in the Greek. He's got methods. Yes. He's skillful at what he does. Yes. But hallelujah, yes. if you and I stay close to the Holy yes. Spirit, yes. if we stay sensitive to the Holy Spirit, yes. he, will, he will speak to us yes. in advance. Yes. And he will warn us. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. It's good to be warned in advance. Yes. Right? You got bridge, you got those signs on the road. Bridge out ahead. <laughs> what, what fool would it be just to bear along through and keep going? But Lord knows, look, I hate to say it, but I've been a fool before. <laughs> because those road signs speak to us. That's the Holy Spirit speaking to us. 
some of you, all of you in this place, the Holy Spirit's been speaking things to you. Hallelujah. He's been urging you and nudging you. Some of you, he's been nudging you to just trust him. Come on. And to, and to, and to step out. Yes. And, and to believe him for something. Some of you, he's been urging you to spend more time in his presence. Some of you, he's been urging you to put certain things away and to turn from certain things and to embrace other things. But if he's urging us, Lord, help us to respond. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So he's able to keep us from falling. The Lord in his power and his grace and his mercy can keep us from falling. But look, and our willingness to, to learn and to partner with him releases grace, which is power to walk with the Lord. Amen. But look, unwillingness to walk in obedience to God's word. I put it in my notes. So I felt like I felt like the Lord was leading me to put it in my notes. Someone that said it. Unwillingness to walk in obedience to God's word is rebellion. Yes. Which is the spirit of witchcraft. <coughs> this puts us in opposition towards God and his word. That's the word of God. Rebellion is as the spirit of witchcraft. Lord, help us. Amen. Lord, help us to stay true to you. He said, the Lord bless thee. The Lord keep thee. Let his face shine upon thee. Amen. It's a beautiful thing when the light of God shines upon a human life. Amen. I believe that. I've seen since I've turned my heart to the Lord. God, God has been so good to me. I'm just going to, and I don't mean that to make you feel weird or whatever. I, I just know that I don't deserve Praise the goodness that God has poured on me. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and I'm so grateful. The Bible says the goodness of God will lead a man to repentance. That's right. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And, and you know, one of the things about the light is I was thinking about Exodus 14, 20. It says, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. It was like a cloud. Okay. And, and it was a cloud and darkness to them talking about Egypt. But it gave light by night to those, which was Israel, so that the one came not near the other. God's light for his people is like darkness to the world. The enemy, amen, when the light of God shows up, it's like whenever you turn light off and turn the light on in a roach infested house. And then things just scurry. I know it's kind of gross analogy. But look, and then things just scurry because they're running from the dark, right? And that's the way that the light of God is. The light of God is darkness. To the forces of evil. The light of God is darkness to the enemy. And when the light of God is shining on the lives of his people, amen, then, 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 then God's power and his anointing is, is working and operating in us. Amen. This is a scripture that I've been using a lot lately, but I'm going to use it again. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. He says, we also have a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that you take heed. Now, if you go up a, a couple of verses, <laughs> if you go up a couple of verses, what you'll see is Peter says this. He says, he says, we're not talking to you about cunningly devised fables. You know, I was telling that to the guys in the jail in Morgan City today. It, it's almost like this stuff wasn't written on a scribble pad in some back alley, in some dark alley. Peter's like, no, this isn't some cunningly devised fable that we wrote about under candlelight in some clandestine meeting somewhere. No, we're, we're telling you what we saw. And what we saw was he transfigured before our faith. We saw the glory of God emanate out of his person. Amen. And we're here to tell you that the prophets of old spoke whenever the Holy Spirit moved upon them. But there's a more sure word of prophecy that is for you today. And you would do well if you would take heed. I told them men in the jail today, I'll tell you here tonight, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be telling some people over the next few days, you would do well to take heed to this sure word of prophecy because it's like a light that will shine in the midst of a darkened place. Maybe you find yourself in darkness. You don't have to stay in darkness, my friend. That's a lie of the enemy. You can come up 
out of that darkness. That darkness that tries to grip your mind and tries to hold you down. You don't have to stay in that place. The devil is a liar and he has no control over your life. He has been defeated at the cross. Hallelujah. Stand up and allow the day star, Jesus, to rise on the inside of your heart. Amen. To bring light in the midst of that dark place. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, oh, hallelujah. Let's just keep going right here. The problem that we run into is that sometimes we don't want to stay or remain under the place where his face is shining for us or shining on us. You know what I'm saying? There's a place of obedience, a place of surrender, where the shining face of God looks upon us and his favor is for us. But, but sometimes we get a little antsy, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? We get, we get a little, uh, a little... I don't know if nervous is the right word or we, we get a little fidgety. Yeah, fidgety. I know. Uh, a little agitated. Yeah. It's not moving as fast as I want it to move. That's right. It's not moving as fast as I want it to move. I felt like the Lord gave me a word. And so, you know, look, the word of God says this a man that finds a wife finds a good thing. So I'm going to go find me a wife, is what he said in his heart. I'm about to go embark on this journey, right, Jim? I'm going to find me a, a wife because the word of God said a man that finds a wife finds a good thing. Come on. Amen. The Bible says that he will prosper his people. So I'm about to go on my prosperity walk right here. And we start to, we start to do things. And, and look, we, we use the word of God yeah. to say that we're walking in God's will, but we're not learning how to be still and know that I am God. Yeah. Will you learn to wait on me? Will you learn to wait on my timing or will you continue to take things and matters into your own hands? And whenever we do that, sometimes. Now listen, God will always come back and let his face shine upon you again. I just got to tell you that he will. When you get your heart right with the Lord, he is ready. He, listen, now, now that doesn't mean that grace never runs out. Let me be a clear preacher here. There comes a day whenever we, we contend with the Most High, we ignore His call, and we can, we can be disobedient to the point where grace runs out, amen, uh, and time runs out. That's possible. There will be people that, that God loved in hell. You do realize that, that God loves everyone. You do realize that, that there will be people that said that they loved God and they will end up in hell. Okay, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to be a balanced preacher. That's all I'm, all I'm trying to do right here. But I will say this, that if you find yourself that you've picking something up and you've tried to travel and do it your own way and you feel as though maybe the face of God isn't shining upon you as it once did, I can tell you that wherever you left him, if you'll go back to that place and you'll renounce it and you'll repent, that his face wants to shine upon you. He wants his favor, amen, to be poured out upon your life, amen? Praise God. He says, the next thing he said was this, he wants to be gracious unto thee. Kindness, favor, mercy. One of the words used is actually the word pity. He's merciful towards us and he doesn't give us what we deserve. Isn't that ain't it good? Oh, man. Yeah, I, I know some of you in here probably have lived a much cleaner life than maybe I did for my first 19 years, but I'm just so grateful that he didn't give me, and even since then, that he didn't give me what I deserved. Amen. You know? Amen. He put that on Jesus. What I deserved, he put he put that on Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. You know, I was thinking that most of us in this house tonight, I would believe that that should ring true in our hearts, right? That God has been merciful to us and that we realize that he has indeed blessed us with his kindness and his favor. Sometimes though, people, 
sometimes people don't, they don't get it. Like they don't see where they really did all that bad or, or, or they still, or now they, they feel as though, you know, there's a danger with that spirit of pride that I was talking to those prisoners about today. That, that spirit of pride will prevent the Holy Spirit from getting in and dealing with our heart, you know? I thought I was going to preach on Isaiah chapter 6 whenever Isaiah entered into the presence of the Lord and he said, Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. But then the Lord drew me to this. You know, there's a, I don't know what happens to us. Sometimes, see, because sometimes the spirits are spirits of addiction. You know, so, so oftentimes we focus on addictions and we, we focus on, you know, I don't know, lust problems. We focus on all of these kinds of things like that. But it's a whole lot of other spirits by a whole lot of other flavors that try to attach themselves. And they will definitely try to attach themselves to the children of God, too. Now, I'm not here to argue with you whether they in you or on you. I don't even care about none of that. I'm talking about if you do not want to be influenced by demonic spirits. Amen. And sometimes these demonic spirits will convince us that we're okay. Jesus had a conversation in Matthew chapter 9, verses 10 through 13. It came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans, those were tax collectors, and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why does your master eat with publicans or tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold, they don't need a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what it means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice for I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you feel like you've read a good bit of the Gospels? Like, I mean, you don't have to really raise your hand. That's okay. But if you, if you feel like maybe you haven't read a lot of the rest of the Bible, but maybe read a lot of the Gospels. If you haven't, then let me clue you in on something. The Pharisees are the main antagonists of Jesus. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Anytime you got a story moving forward, a narrative story, you got a protagonist, and an antagonist. Jesus is definitely the protagonist of the Gospels, and the Pharisees are his antagonists. And these religious leaders that are constantly trying to catch him in a trap, constantly trying to trip him up, constantly trying to mess him up. He, he told them, he said, you are of your father the devil. That's what he told them. He said, you're a bunch of whitewashed tombs filled with dead men's bones. You strain out a gnat, and, you got, and you'll swallow a camel. Because a gnat was unclean, and then, oh my goodness, look at the little gnat in our tea. Let's get the little tiny strainer and get the gnat out. And a camel was unclean. He said, you eat a whole camel. You're over here worried about this gnat, but you'll eat a whole camel. You're so unclean. But look, so when he says this right here, he says, when Jesus heard them, he says this, they that are whole don't need a physician, but they that are sick. Do you think he was trying to tell them that he thought that they were whole? Do you think he was trying to tell them that he thought that they weren't sick? No, but that's what they believed. That's what they had believed and had been blinded by a spirit of self-righteousness that had clouded their vision, blinded their mind, and oh, look, the, the, those spirits love to grab a hold of people that ain't never had no kind of addiction problems. Oh, Lord, help us. Because, because I've had conversations with people before, and they're like, oh, man, but look what your life used to be. Look, you don't even want to know what I told that brother, because I definitely was probably in the flesh a little bit on that one. But, 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 you know, sometimes people have this attitude that because other people had this kind of failure in their life, and they never had that failure, that they're always up here and somebody else is down. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Yeah, and, and a spirit that will make you think that you're okay when you're not is more dangerous than a spirit of addiction because most of the time people that have had a problem with addiction realize that they're not right and want to be right because they're miserable in the midst of the place where they are. So Lord, help us. Let him be gracious unto thee. Pour out your grace. Pour out your mercy, Lord. Let my eyes see and understand how good you have been to me. Amen.
Praise God. Hallelujah. When, when, when it, it, mercy, it means goodwill towards the afflicted. You know, I was thinking about th the song that the angels sang. I mean, Christmas is coming up soon. I don't even know if they'll sing this song. But, and I guess there's a song that sings it. See, this is, this is, this is my favorite, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Let me tell you why. See, when you start getting into all the conspiracy stuff, kind of like what I've traveled down some of those roads, and you start realizing, oh my gosh, man, December 25th is likely connected to the winter festivals. And then, you know, and then you start talking to people, hey, you're over here celebrating Christmas and it's not even the right time of the year and it's the winter harvest and all that. I said, look, bud, let me tell you something. You, you can say whatever you want and, and nobody knows exactly when Jesus was born. We could sit here and we could try to really do some heavy duty math. And we can try to figure some stuff out. But let me just tell you one thing. You want to know why I celebrate his birthday? Because heaven celebrated his birthday. Hallelujah. The heavens opened up and the angelic choir began to sing. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace. Goodwill towards men. You want to talk about mercy? Praise God. God poured mercy when he poured Jesus out upon this earth. Peace and goodwill towards men. Amen. Amen. Hey, singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. I'm just going <coughs> to close with that last little part where it says, lift up his countenance upon me. You know, the countenance goes back to the face. He said it earlier that his face would shine upon you. But that he would lift up his countenance, his face. God promises his people that he will meet with them. And, and one thought that comes to mind was the showbread in the Old Testament. There was a table called the table of showbread. And it was changed out every seventh day with new fresh bread. Twelve loaves that represented the twelve tribes of Israel. And it was called the face bread. It's almost like nowadays we got face time. The bread was a reminder that God's presence was with them. And that every seventh day, the priest would go, and it, and it was there was a very ritualistic thing. They'd have to pull the six off and hurry up and put the new six on there. And then they were allowed to eat the bread in the presence of the Lord. It was a type of communion to be in the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen. And also, I'm just going to close with this, but two things that Ruth, you know, I don't, God's hand of blessing is upon his people. I want you to know that. And, and Ruth, I don't know if you know the story of Ruth, but it's just a four chapter book in the Old Testament. And she came back with her mother-in-law. She came back from Moab with her mother-in-law. And she, the Bible says she hacked upon the field of Boaz. And that word hacked, really the, the word means providence. Like God arranged and pre-ordered the events that she ended up in the right place at the right time and whenever the blessings of God began to be poured out on her there she was like what in the world why would it? he said because you have brought yourself under the wings of the God of Israel and this is what he does for his people he blesses them amen Listen.